Leading Ideas Talks podcast is brought to you by the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Subscribe free to our weekly e-newsletter, Leading Ideas, at churchleadership.com slash leading ideas. Leading Ideas Talks is also brought to you by World Religions, passionately Christian and compassionately interreligious a new online course from Wesley Pathways for Ministry. You will learn how to graciously encounter and understand the various religious beliefs and practices of our neighbors. Then explore how you can think about Christian mission in such an interreligious world. The course begins February 9th, 2024. Enroll now at wesleypathways.com. And remember to stay up to date with the latest church leadership strategies and information Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos. How would you preach next Sunday if tomorrow your community fell victim to a mass shooting or was devastated by a natural disaster? In this episode, preaching professor Kimberly Wagner shares how pastors can approach this increasingly unavoidable homiletic task in ways that hold intention the community's very real experiences of loss and grief, and the promise of God's healing and redemption. Welcome to Leading Ideas Talks. My name is Ann Michael. I'm a senior consultant with Lewis Center for Church Leadership. I'm one of the editors of Leading Ideas e-newsletter, and I'm pleased to be this host for this episode of Leading Ideas Talks. Um, my guest today is Kim Wagner, who's an assistant professor of preaching at Princeton Theological Seminary, and she's the author of a recently published book, Fractured Ground, Preaching in the Wake of Mass Trauma. It is such a timely and important subject. Uh, so welcome to Leading Ideas Talks, Kim. Thank you so much. It's so good to, to be with you and have this conversation. Yeah. So in the foreword uh, to your book, um, Tom Long wrote that with the proliferation of gun violence, mass shootings, pandemics, and natural disasters, sadly, almost every pastor will sooner or later face the daunting task of preaching to shaken people after the sudden and surprising loss of life. Um, you know, no one who watches the news, I think, could disagree with the need for preachers to consider how they might prepare themselves to face this eventuality. Uh, so I get why this is such an important subject for preachers and professors of preaching. But I wanted to ask, what led you personally to take on this subject? That's such a great question. Thanks. Yeah. So um, throughout my my kind of uh, lives, my professional lives, I kept finding myself amid communities experiencing trauma. So my first job was actually my undergraduate degree is in secondary life science education. Um, and I taught 10th grade biology and eighth grade earth and space science in um, Cincinnati, Ohio, in, in the city, and had a lot of students who were experiencing trauma, poverty, uh, a lot of gang violence was uh, mm -hmm. infecting our school. Um, and so found myself teaching in that circumstance. Uh, then I went and um, went to seminary, um, or as my colleagues in the middle school said it, my teaching drove me to a life of prayer. That was their, their <laughs> joke about seminary. Um, but I went to seminary and during my time in seminary, had the opportunity to serve as a student chaplain at a maximum security women's prison for almost two and a half years. Um, and it deeply shaped my ministry, my life, my my questions, right? Um, and, uh, and, and found myself very much called to to the, these communities experiencing trauma. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to the parish, um, I, I'm ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA, and I went to a parish in Southeast Virginia, and I thought, you know what, like, I've had enough with these communities experiencing trauma, I'm going to go to a congregation. Well, of course, as to be predicted, uh, that congregation had a great deal of trauma that it was dealing with before I got there, and trauma that popped up in unexpected ways. So for example, while I was pastoring there, uh, the Sandy Shook Sandy Hook shootings happened mm -hmm. uh, in Newtown, Connecticut. And for some of our congregants, it was like it was happening to us, like in our backyard. And it took me a while to figure out what was going on. And finally, 
by the grace of God, I figured out that some of our folks had been deeply affected by the Virginia Tech shootings oh. and had never talked about it and had never dealt with it. And it just wasn't something that they thought they could bring to church, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and other issues around um, abuse and addiction um, and, and grief really popped up during my ministry. So when I went to go do my PhD work, I decided I wanted to think a little bit, a little bit about trauma, and I wanted to write a seminar paper, a 30-page paper, not very long, um, on uh, preaching in response to mass shootings. And when I went to look for the materials, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot in trauma and pastoral care, or, you right. know, trauma and psychology, that kind of stuff. But just not a lot. There was nothing that I could find mm -hmm. on trauma, uh, preaching in the wake of mass shootings. And so I did what every good PhD student does. I went and complained to anyone who would listen to me, um, including my advisor and my peers. And they all said the same thing. Well, maybe you should write it. And mm -hmm. I said, well, that's a terrible idea. Um, let's not do that. But the more I dug into it, the more I felt called to this work and realized how all of my past experiences at the high school and the middle school at the prison um, mm -hmm. in my ministry really led me to be able to read this stuff and recognize my experiences in it. Um, and so uh, I, I, it's become a deep sense of call alongside being academic work. And so with the book and when I teach, I, I hope people see kind of that, that dual um, intellect, heart and mind, right? The pastoral mm -hmm. meets the academic um, and that, that, that shines through because it really does come from a pastoral space um, yes. with an mm -hmm. academic edge, right? With an right. academic I mean, that, That's very evident in the book. In fact, uh, for our listeners know, the book really begins by helping people understand the nature of trauma. Um, yeah. 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 So yeah, that's, that's extremely helpful. So before we get into your recommendations uh, for preaching in the wake of mass trauma, uh, you identify some less than helpful pull ways that preachers often respond to community crises. And I wondered if you could just quickly name some of those as a starting point. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I want to always start by saying, I think that Every time, for, for the most part, I think preachers, when they respond in less than helpful ways, they're doing it out of a genuine sense of care and, and, and inter, you know, and, and, and desire to help. Uh, because I do think that um, none of us have been trained to teach and preach and minister in these days, right? Um, we're, we're encountering trauma on trauma. Uh, often interacting and exacerbating um, collective traumas. And so I want to always start by saying, I think there are less than helpful ways, but that oftentimes they're done with the best of intentions. Right. So so three ways I think that preachers will often um, uh, be inclined. The first way I think preachers are inclined is to just lament, right? To just say, to throw up their hands and say, oh my goodness, there is nothing we can say that is hopeful or good or, mm -hmm. or lovely um, in this moment. There is nothing faithful to say. And all I can do is just lament and to just kind of shut down uh, this sense of that there's anything faithful to, to say and all we can do is cry out to God together. That's one end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. The other end of the spectrum, I think uh, another response is folks will just default the opposite way to just platitudes and reciting all of the, the 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 faith statements they've always said god's got it it'll be okay in the sweet by and by right to try to just create platitudes and 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 stack faith almost against the pain mm -hmm. hoping that if they can out scream the pain that that will be true right or or out right. out out speak it um and then the third way i think that happens a lot of times is folks ignore it. Um, and I've seen plenty of preachers, I think less and less, this is an option. Um, right. But historically, um, there have been preachers that when these situations happen, they think that doesn't belong in church, right? Or I don't even know how to begin to address right. this in the pulpit. So I'm not it's going not to. It's not in the lectionary today, right? Right, it wasn't in the lectionary, right? I have, yeah. and I planned my sermons out, right? Right. Um, and so oftentimes I think what happens is we, we default one side or the other, either all lament or all kind of trying to, to stack faith language up against pain mm -hmm. in order to kind of silence it, or we just kind of ignore it. Um, and even the ignoring it, I find really fascinating when I talk to 
that preachers don't want to talk about these things in the pulpit. Um, it's less so, sometimes it's, I just don't know what to say. Sometimes they don't want to talk about it in the pulpit too, because they think it's the elephant in the room and that everybody already knows, right? Yeah. That, that, um, that they are like, I don't want to bring that up. Like yeah. I have a, a student I work with, uh, in a doctor of ministry program. She's an amazing pastor and preacher. Uh, but during the pandemic, their community was impacted directly by gun violence. Um, and, uh, they lost actually a young woman in the mm -hmm. church to a stray bullet. Um, and when they came back together, she was really reticent, uh, this preacher, to talk about this incident with the community. I mean, time had passed. Of course, it was the heart of the pandemic. They couldn't gather to mourn her, this young woman. And I talked with her about why she didn't want to talk about this young woman. Um, and she said, listen, we sit in a pew and we hear gunshots outside the window. Right. Gun violence is not something that they don't think is happening. And I said, yeah, but what would it mean to talk about gun violence in holy spaces? Right. Yeah. Or to take the sacred time of the sermon and of prayers to name that brokenness and to add faith language to it. Right. And so I think a lot of times when folks resist it, it's not a I don't feel like it. It's a fear that do I really want to to wrestle with the elephant in the room, you know? Right. Mm hmm. Well, well, building on what you said about sort of the less than helpful responses, either being only lamenting the problem or only giving sort of hopeful platitudes. Um, one of the things you say in, in your book is that in preaching in the wake of mass trauma, you confront the eschatological tension between um, what's been broken and lost on one hand and the anticipation of God's promised hope on the other hand. And if I'm reading your book, Book properly, I think you say that it's a mistake to rush too quickly to the messages of hope and redemption without honestly naming the brokenness in the moment. And so, um, can you speak a bit to how how, how preachers, preachers can strike that balance? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, you're reading it exactly right. I, I'm resisting the urge to collapse. So I talk about sitting in this eschatological tension, right? On one side, death, loss, brokenness, mm -hmm. on the other side, hope, resurrection, redemption. And, and I think the errors that we talked about are the tendency to collapse, you know, collapse that tension. Now, preaching in that tension doesn't mean right down the middle, right? Um, there are times that I don't think we rush to hope and promise and resurrection, particularly in the immediate aftermath, right? We may find ourselves preaching over toward the death loss side, but still holding that thread of hope. I tell my students all the time that sometimes all we can hold out is the promise of hope that we have not yet experienced, mm -hmm. right? That there's a theology there that says that, that hope is coming, that God is coming, right? Um, I think a lot about the prophet Habakkuk, right? Standing on the rampart, leaning and saying in the midst of the destruction of the city and saying, I will wait. I'm going to stand on the mm -hmm. rampart and see what God will yet say. You know, I often will ask my students in my preaching and I teach a preaching and trauma class. And after their sermon, I will sometimes ask them where in this tension, if yeah. we were to draw this tension out, um, where in this tension do you think you're preaching? And, and, and how is that appropriate to where your congregation is? Because mm -hmm. the reality is, is that we don't, I also want to say, it's not a progression from one end to the other. Right. It's not like you start at the pain and death and loss side and, and gradually work your way to the hope and resurrection side. This isn't a one way street. I think mm -hmm. it's a tension we continually navigate right. because, um, as you know, anniversaries come up. Right. Mm -hmm. um, holidays come up and all of a sudden the grief of that loss is fresh and new in, in very mm -hmm. real ways. Um, court cases start. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, another shooting happens yep. that is reminiscent of the one year community mm -hmm. experience right mm -hmm. and all those things will pull your congregation back towards perhaps needing you to preach more on that death loss side than the resurrection hope side but again always holding the tension and resisting the collapse mm-hmm
So um, in your book, you really explore two prototypes of how to structure a trauma re uh, response sermon. And I think it's probably a little bit too complicated for our discussion today to go into those in depth. But I do want to at least alert our listeners to the fact that they're going to find a very thoughtful, theologically sensitive analysis of some different models of how you can approach the, the homiletical task um, in the face of trauma. Um, but I, I did observe that one of the things that I think both the approaches that you study um, have in common is that the goal isn't to try to tidy everything up or make sense of everything. Uh, in, in, in both cases, that it's okay to leave some open questions. Um, yeah. And so I, I yeah. just wanted to, you know, if you want to comment on that for a moment. Absolutely. No, that's really helpful and a great summary of it. So early in the book, um, I talk about, I, I offer this language of something called narrative fracture, um, which I, which I assess as kind of the, um, what happens to particularly communities and individuals experiencing trauma that, um, I talk about a dual crisis of a loss of time and a loss of coherence, that the stories they tell about themselves and the world and their communities and their families and even God don't hold together anymore in time or in order. And I talk about that as narrative fracture. And so a lot of the rest of the book is trying to say, OK, so if we have communities, individuals and communities experiencing narrative fracture. How do we respond faithfully and what guides do we have for that? And so I talk about kind of that preaching in the eschatological tension as, as the sermon content, right? How do we, how do we position mm -hmm. the content of our sermon? But I think it matters too that we honor and pay attention to narrative fracture in sermon form as well. And that's exactly the part you were talking about. And I offer two prototypes. I love that mm -hmm. language you use of sermon forms, because for me, it's thinking creatively about how do we preach in ways that honor, name, bless narrative fracture without trying to too quickly resolve it. Because I think what I, we want to do is we want to say, I can fix this. I can make these stories whole again. And we want to rush to that because that feels good and healthy and, and, and like we want to get it done, right? We want to get through the process and check it off our list. But the reality is, is I think that our preaching in both its content and its form can let people who are experiencing narrative fracture know that their experience is not beyond the grace and love of God and not beyond the biblical witness and not beyond the community. And in fact, in modeling this in our preaching, right, in modeling narrative fracture in the ways we even put our sermons together, we can do this work of blessing. We can also do this work of modeling healthy and faithful trauma response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. So yeah. As, as I read your book, I, I, I was aware of the fact that I think you were really looking at this issue through primarily a congregational care lens. You mentioned that a minute ago. And I sense that the primary audience that you're concerned with um, uh, in thinking about this preaching task is the congregation that's gathered on Sunday morning and the sort of the immediate task of helping them to reconcile a traumatic incident and the, their response to it with their existing belief system. But as I was reading, I was wondering if there isn't a broader audience for preaching in the wake of traumatic events, because I think when a crisis occurs, um, even in our very, very secular age, uh, people beyond the church turn to the faith community to uh, for solace, to make meaning of it. Um, I'm not a working preacher, but um, I used to be on the staff of a big church in Washington, D.C., uh, a church mm -hmm. that just happened to be without a senior pastor in September of 2001. Uh, and I oh, had the no. responsibility of preaching in a very prominent pulpit uh, less than two weeks after September 11th. And wow. I have never seen our church as full. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, could it possibly be that Osama bin Laden is really our best evangelist? <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, my point is this, that what the church has to say in the face of tragedy, it's not just a matter of congregational care. It's also an act of public witness. It's a, a ministry to the broader community. Um, one of the pastors that I had the privilege of serving under actually was serving a church in Dallas when Kennedy was assassinated. And mm. um, just this past November, when the press accounts of the 60th anniversary of the Kennedy death were coming out, I saw several references to his sermon and to the sermons of other mm. Dallas preachers on that day. And so I think for good or for ill, um, 
these are times when the rest of the world looks to the church and says, you know, what do you have to say? <laughs> uh, Absolutely. And so, yeah. And so I, I guess my question is, um, how can someone who's preaching in the wake of mass trauma take into account the fact that there's a much wider audience for their words, and it's probably an audience that's less theologically sophisticated, that's less biblically literal, literate than their their audience of regular churchgoers, and yet they're listening. <laughs> um, yeah. No. Well, that's an amazing story, and bless you for that 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 ministry in in the wake of nine eleven. That's unbelievable. The sermons that have come out of that, and the sermons that have come, you know. I, I, I could have filled the book, right, with these sermons, although some of them are hard to find because people oftentimes yeah. will not write down the sermon they preach, um, that it's it's done almost extemporaneously, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to your question, I, I wish um, if I were to rename the book, I would rename it uh, Fractured Ground Proclamation in the Wake of Mass Trauma. Um, if I were to do it again, um, and I'm not going to do it again. This is this is this, and we have <laughs> well, other projects on the horizon. Of that. It is a form of proclamation, absolutely. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the audience for this book is, I think the first row of the room is is Sunday morning preachers who have these patterns and ways of speaking that all of a sudden get thrown into chaos in the wake of of a mass traumatic event, right? I think that the second row is community leaders and those who have to speak into these situations. Um, it's very interesting. I, I got had the chance to also work with, um, uh, I've been working with folks who do more nonprofit work lately, and that's mm -hmm. been really cool to see how that work intersects and how they have to speak to their nonprofit organizations and their communities in the wake right. of traumatic realities. Um, and then I've had, I, I actually had a, a gentleman come to a, a, a webinar I did who was a lawyer and he's like this was super helpful for me as I think about working yeah. with individuals and communities who are experiencing trauma in the courtroom right um but I do think that one of the the, the things I did not want to lose um in this book is that public witness piece and the idea that mm -hmm. the preacher and the church and 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 our our faith still has something to say in these moments, right? That I do think it is an opportunity for public witness. Um, and I think that the preacher is called upon to model well um, this, this faithful trauma response, which we see again and again in scripture, right? The beautiful thing is that we have models for this, right? Um, and toward the end of the book, I talk about uh, lessons from the wilderness wanderings, right? Every time the Israelites are in the wilderness, they are dealing with mass trauma of some kind, whether it's um, a displacement, whether it is exile, whether it is escape from uh, slavery in Egypt, right? They're dealing with it. And so we have all this literature that is modeling, for better or ill, um, some of the ways that that the tendencies of our community, but also how faithful responses to it. Um, and so I do think it is an opportunity for the church to, um, I think it is the place where the church probably gets the loudest hearing. Yeah. Um, one of the places where the church gets the loudest hearing in today's world. And that is when, when literally all hell breaks loose, right? Yeah that people um, people look and say, is there, is one of the few times I think that people who are not church look and ask, is there a word from the Lord? Right, right. And that's, right. A, that's, a, that's, a, that's an awesome responsibility, you know, it's a, it's it a is. responsibility, but it's, a, you know, it, it mm -hmm. seems like we have to be at least aware of that, 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 that audience and that potential. So absolutely. So to draw this to a close, um, I think one of the most important subtexts in your book is the idea that you can't wait until a disaster or a crisis happens to think about how you might preach in response to it. And so um, beyond reading your book, um, are there other simple steps that you would recommend that working preachers take to prepare themselves for the time when disaster might come to their community? Absolutely, that's such a great question. Um, yeah, I don't think we have the, you know, when it happens, we don't have time. So right. we need to often prepare. So a few things to think about. Uh, the first is, is that as you think about your week to week preaching, think about uh, using trauma lenses to look at some of these texts, right? To practice, where do you see trauma at work in the text? Or how, 
does looking with a lens of the trauma that is going on in the world help you see something new or different in that text? And so not um, not just saying like, I'm going to save all that for later, but preaching it. Because the other thing is, is I think that we do this trauma aware preaching. Um, I talk, I talk about um, when I, when I talk about things, I talk about trauma responsive being what we do in the immediate aftermath of an incident, but then also trauma aware, which is always mindful that there are those in the pews experiencing trauma, those in our communities who are experiencing trauma, those in the world experiencing trauma, and that trauma is at work in these texts. Um, and so I think practicing that with our congregation, and it doesn't have to be every week, but but practicing it over and over, it ends up becoming, I think, language held in trust for us and for our communities mm-hmm. for when we need it, right? Okay. And so one of the things I always encourage preachers is this is not something to put on the shelf and pull out. Not, I'm not talking about my book, but the, the skills are right. not something that you put on the shelf and pull out when you need them. You keep practicing them. Keep practicing what it means to preach in the tension and not make sure every sermon ends with a happily ever after. Right. What does it mean to tell stories in our preaching that aren't easily resolved? Right. Or what does it mean to hold in tension some of the things that are hard to reconcile in our biblical texts um, to model and to practice what yeah. it is we have to do when we encounter trauma? What does it mean to hold that eschatological tension in our day to day work so that we've we've exercised those muscles? And so my encouragement is to think about these things, right, to think about your theology a big example of when I think congregations and communities and individuals come face to face with with a theology they don't think about until it happens is natural disasters, right? Mm-hmm. When a natural disaster happens, that's when people say, okay, so does God teach yeah. through nature? Does God correct? Or is God punishing us? Did God just create the world and walk away and has no control mm-hmm. over it? Is God just choosing not to... St- keep us safe from storms, right? The more we talk about climate crisis, the more we're, mm-hmm. we're seeing these kind of storms, um, uh, you know, we are going, people are having to contend and s- with their theology of the relationship between God, nature, and humanity, right? And they don't contend with that and they shouldn't, they, th- mm-hmm. there's no reason to until they're hit with a natural disaster. And then it's important that like you said, that the preacher, the pastor, the leader, the the faith, the faith leader has a sense of their own theology, right? Even if it is not, even if you know, but a way to offer a theology that that is that hold is able to hold this and say, this is what I believe about the relationship mm-hmm. between God and nature, because your community they're not thinking about it until it hits them, right? Um, so yeah, absolutely. I love the way you're thinking about that. So that's the second, absolutely, is to, <laughs> to nurture that theology. The third thing I have to mention before I, I let you sign us off is I think it's so important for pastors and preachers, particularly to build communities of support. Mm-hmm. Um, and that means both other clergy, um, as well as nonprofit leaders, as well as uh, other leaders in the community, uh, whether that is... Um, you know, I, I always tell my my young pastors heading out, like the first person you need to make friends with is the funeral director in your town, right? Because they are at the heart of what, when these things happen, they're there, right? Um, and, uh, you know, and thinking about what does it mean to build a community of support? Because one of the lies that, that, um, that trauma tells us, and it tells preachers this very loudly, because let's be clear, when a mass traumatic event happens, it's not like the preacher can avoid it, right? If they're in the community, they're going to be experiencing it alongside the community. And one of the lies that, um, one of the bad ones that trauma whispers in our ear is that our pain is unique and we are alone and nobody can help Mm us. Um, And I think that happens both in the kind of the recovery conversation, but it also happens in you supporting your community. I cannot tell you how many preachers and pastors I work with who say one of the first things they realized is I felt was I am totally alone in leading this community and nobody can help us and nobody can help me and nobody can help me lead this community. And so creating these communities of support and care and, and, and coworkers, Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in the, in the in-between times, right. will help combat 
some of that desire to become the community superhero um, and to think that you don't have anybody to help you personally, but also your community. You don't have to lead them alone, right? You don't have right. to, you are not alone in supporting them. And so kind of the last thing to say is, and it's maybe a more general pastoral thing, but cultivate communities of support, get connected to organizations. There's so many organizations. I named some of those resources in the back of the book. Um, there's more and more every day um, of, of groups that can come in and help you um, and can help you support your community. So um, just to say, nurturing those relationships, I think it becomes very key. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that really good advice. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation on such an important subject. So I hope it's going to help people to really begin to think about um, the importance of being uh, prepared for this task. Again, the book is Fractured Ground, Preaching in the Wake of Mass Trauma. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. And thank you for this very important work. Thank you. It has been such a joy. Thanks for joining us for Leading Ideas Talks. Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos.